so great to be here. Uh, I'm Ken Goldberg, SVP of Engineering at CoreWeave. I'm Peter Solanke. I'm the CoreWeave CTO. If you don't know who CoreWeave is, we're the AI hyperscaler. We bring the latest technologies to AI enterprises all over the world faster and more reliable than anyone else. In the last decade, we have seen an explosion of workloads running on Kubernetes. From e-commerce platforms to gaming servers, web application and databases. Now, it's the AI era. At CoWeave, we decided to take advantage of Kubernetes superpowers to run our customers' training and inference workloads. When you think about running a training job on thousands of nodes or scaling up and down your inference platform based on demand, it all makes sense. But what makes it a harder problem than usual? Well, you know, GPUs are scarce and expensive. You also want to use the latest and greatest tech as soon as it's available. The definition of good has evolved. It's not only reliability and availability like before, we are also talking about performance and how long it takes to train a new model. And we want to solve for all of that as quickly as possible without interrupting researchers and developers. So I hope you agree with me that solving hard problems is the fun part, and let's dive in. As you can see, there are a ton of complex physical components that have direct impact to your hyper-connected training cluster in Kubernetes. Any change in any layer of the stack can impact the cluster health or the job performance. And if something goes wrong, even as little as a network cable bent too sharply, it has detrimental impact to the entire cluster. Silent data corruption might also occur and can severely affect model quality. And repeat offenders and intermittent failures are not a nonsense. They are the obstacle for experimenting and getting things done quickly. As a platform team, I need to maintain a healthy, resilient, and performant AI training clusters. So how can I do it on Kubernetes? Well, it is possible, but it's not as easy, and that's something that everyone in the industry is now grappling with. So how big of a challenge? This big. These stats <coughs> were published by Meta this summer in their Llama 3 Herd of Models paper. And it describes the interruptions experience of a 54 day pre-training period. As you can see, they experienced 466 total job interruptions. Out of them, 417 of them were unexpected interruptions. And 78 of those were uh, related to suspected hardware failures. Unfortunately, for many teams, you might not even have these insights. If your infrastructure lives in a black box, you may not know if a job fails, let alone what might have caused it. When we look, talk about looking under the hood of a Kubernetes training cluster, this is a key concept. With all that complexity, scale, and rapid change with the infrastructure, interruptions are inevitable. And teams need greater observability into what's going on with their clusters, because there will be interruptions, and you need a plan for dealing with it. So is it even possible to improve the effective training time? Let's look at the data again. They experienced approximately two interruptions per day with a 90% effective training time. This is already good, but it's not great. And I'm sure the meta folks would love to see this number improve. Now imagine if you can cut in half the number of interrupts. Imagine the performance improvement you gain, as well as the time and cost you could save. These are the stats pulled from one of the training jobs running on CoWeave. We work closely with platform teams to help solve this issue and to build the most stable and capable clusters on the planet. So before zooming in on what we're really doing, let's take a step back and look at the anatomy of a training cluster. Starting from the left, we have the control plane and cluster management side. This is where we you know, manage the API server or the consistency of etcd. Then we look at the container, life, the cluster lifecycle and the health of it. 
And finally, an area we take a lot of pride in is the fleet management. Being able to properly manage the state and health of the physical hardware and Kubernetes nodes is a key investment area for us. So what should you take away from this? One, we leverage Kubernetes common patterns like operators to handle the dynamic nature of the environment. Two, we take advantage of many technologies in the cloud native landscape. And most importantly, we look at and optimize the entire stack for AI workloads, from the InfiniBand through bare metal up to the orchestration layer. Why is all this automation and tooling so important? Last year at KubeCon and GTC, we spoke about how we broke the ML Perf world record using the very first H100 production cluster brought to market. Now, we replicated this success many times over, and we scaled this from what was then a 6,000 GPU clusters to clusters over 10,000 GPUs, in some cases even over 30,000 and more GPUs. This would not have been possible to do, especially in this timeline, without a relentless focus on automation. There are a few key patterns that go in to how we build this. First is utilizing Kubernetes as a source of truth anywhere we can. CoreWeave is a Kubernetes company. We've been building on top of and around Kubernetes forever. And therefore, it's natural for us to leverage Kubernetes co uh, concepts and the programming model for infrastructure management, both using built-in uh, constructs and a whole bunch of custom CRDs. Second is lifecycle, which includes provisioning, testing, and delivery. Fully automating this process is critical when delivering AI supercomputers. The LAMA paper offers reflect that running large AI clusters is much harder than running CPU clusters of the same size. We can attest to that. Finally, and probably most importantly, our work doesn't stop when things are in production. All nodes, all GPUs are interconnected and working together in a training job. In the world of ML training, a chain is truly only as strong as its weakest link. And a single underperforming component will reduce the performance of the entire cluster. Therefore, continuous active and passive monitoring and health checking is essential as things that were great a second ago can degrade to the next second. To begin on a couple of examples of what we just mentioned, uh, I'm going to start talking about our bare metal node CRD. This is an abstraction of the regular Kubernetes node CRD uh, that you all have in your clusters, so Kubernetes node resource. The bare metal node CRD allows us to create a definition of a node, a physical server, before it's even been racked and stacked. Uh, this CRD will contain metadata, such as its location, its SKU, and serial numbers. We have also built CRDs for other components like a traditional cloud provider would offer our customers. We have CRDs for VPCs, how to create Kubernetes clusters, and to manage operating system and firmware images. Digging in through the life cycle of a node, all of this is fully orchestrated in Kubernetes on CoreWeave. First, we define a node using the bare metal CRD uh, I just talked about. Then a node is racked and stacked and booted. Uh, it's booted using a small Ubuntu image with a kubelet on it. We try to do everything in Kubernetes, so our images can be pretty light, and it's all stateless in memory. Once a node is booted, it goes into a validation phase. In validation, we make sure that the serial numbers of all the components in a system matches up with what we define in the bare metal node to ensure that the system we racked and stacked is actually the one we expect. There's 10 cables, both Ethernet and InfiniBand, going into each of these servers. If any of them are misconnected or flipped, that will have a determinant impact to performance of the node and of the cluster. So we check that all the cablings are correct as well. Once cable validation is finished, the node goes into firmware provisioning. This is where we upgrade the firmwares of GPUs, hard drives, NICs, BIOS, BMC to the latest and greatest version or to whatever version we decide is fit for production. Once that is complete, we go into burn-in testing. Here we test all the components of the system, GPU, CPU, and more importantly, InfiniBand NICs and fabrics to ensure the communication between all the nodes in the cluster uh, work really well and hit our baseline. Once nodes pass testing, they're delivered into a customer cluster. Here, what we call the node controller takes over and does things like populate metadata on your regular Kubernetes node object. This allows our customers to know the topology, where in the topology their systems are, which is important for scheduling training jobs most efficiently. 
It also run a critical component of active and passive health checks inside customer clusters. We leverage Argo workflows to orchestrate these health checks, and if any of them fails, or any of them indicates subpar performance, the node controller also automatically moves the node out of the customer cluster into what we call the triage state for further investigation. Okay, this sounds really amazing and awesome. Uh, so let's have some fun, let's see it in action. Uh, we have a 15,000 GP running full tilt until all of a sudden we encounter an issue. Ta -da -da -dum. Every second, these 15,000 GPUs sit idle. We are wasting significant resources. In this example, uh, we are discussing the GPU falling off the bus error. In essence, it means the GPU is no longer functioning properly or has become unresponsive due to a hardware failure, a driver, or a system level issue. Okay, so what happens next? Hmm, well, this is gonna be boring. Hey, I'm sorry, uh, I don't have much to show you. In this case, the system detected the error, took action to remove the node from the production cluster into the triage environment, and restarted the job. It took exactly six minutes from detection to remediation, and we didn't need a researcher to point out that something is wrong with their job. We can also look at the system data. Okay, here we can see that an interruption where the job went from running to completed and back to running. In general, we can see that we saw XID errors trickle up from our metrics saying one GPU has fallen off the pass. Because this is a fatal error, the node was removed and the job was restarted. This is all possible because we have chosen to invest in integration non-Kubernetes native systems such as Slurm with the rest of the stack. So going from job ID to low level hardware issue is truly powerful. Having observability throughout the stack means you can create visualization like this and act on issues in real time. So job is back running and we're all good. Well, not quite right. Yes, it's great that a job is back running, our researchers are happy, the cluster is utilized. But we need to understand what caused this issue. Is there a systemic problem with the cluster? And we also need to get the node back into production. Digging in further through metrics, we can see what are the automated conditions that our system set. In this case, we see that conditions are all related to this GPU falling off the bus error and, and um, other triggers. Further digging into the metrics, we need to collect all metrics possible. We obviously have all the standard performance indicators, such as temperature and load. We also track some more esoteric measurements that might not be as familiar. GPUs are connected using the PCI bus. All computers have a PCI bus, including the laptops in your backpacks. PCI is used to connect hard drives, network cards, and similar to the CPU and the system. I don't believe that any one of you are monitoring PCI metrics for your laptops. They're very simple and very unlikely to fail. However, in these complex AI training servers, it's a different story. There are PCI switches. Uh, there's a lot of connect things connected to PCI bus, and more importantly, they're always shuffling a lot of pa packets, a lot of bandwidth to connect GPUs to all the other GPUs in the cluster for infinite band or Ethernet fabrics. Now, we're tracking things like PCI advanced error reporting to not only be able to root cause issue, but also be able to do predictive analytics. When we see correctable error rates or uncorrectable error rates go up, we can know that this can cause an issue and we can take the node out of service before it happens. Taking a step back, by using cloud native technologies like Prometheus and Victoria Metrics in our observability stack, we can not only look at metrics from a single node or a single cluster or a single customer, we can look at our entire fleet of hundreds of thousands of GPUs. We can slice and dice these metrics by things like temperature, data center location, firmware versions, and all kinds of things possible to look at trends and find out bad behaviors and patterns before they affect individual nodes, users, or clusters. Han showed you that this dashboard before, and it's not only useful for platform teams. We can actually give this to researchers. They can plug in their job ID up here to the left, and they can see in their specific job what are any of the hardware or fabric or cluster-level metrics or alerts that affect their job. 
So when they have a performance degradation or an interruption, they don't have to worry about, is it my code that's bad or did something happen with the hardware? They can get that answered instantly and move on with their day. What should we, you remember when leaving this talk? Failures are inevitable. We should not try to uh, prevent them. We should learn how to manage them and manage them well. And we want to pressure things to the max, get the most out of the system, and swiftly handle issues when they occur. Automation is key, and cloud-native technologies and patterns helps us handle life cycle of the hardware fleet, including node management and health checks. And last, efficient fleet management enables full-stack observability. This lets you keep interruption to an absolute minimum and know why they happen when they do. Thank you so much for letting us share our experience. We would love to continue the conversation how to solve these challenges and support AI innovation at scale. So meet us at booth S32. And if you want to learn more, uh, use this QR code. Uh, we're going to have a webinar to go deeply into this topic. Thank you very much.